So do I always test um, athletes using a 4-0 X-0 tempo, even if they're advanced with six plus training years? Uh, no, so when it comes to testing, you always want to test at whatever tempo you're going to use for your primary lifts for um, the off-season training. So typically speaking, year one when I start with a new athlete, I like to use 4-0 X-0 as it gives you a good standard of uh, um, motor control, it gives you a good base of eccentric strength. So in the earlier years, like these are all things that are very important. It just gives you a good base. As you're progressing to the intermediate level, so year two to three, then you can speed up the tempo a little bit to maybe a three zero X zero. And then typically speaking with athletes, once they move on to the advanced stage, so four plus training years, I like to use for the primary more a two zero X zero tempo simply because at this point in time, the uh, base and strength should be high enough that now you know that you have solid, uh, well, base, you have solid uh, joints, ligaments, tendons to accommodate a faster speed of movement. And at that point in time, because a strength base should be high enough, then you want to make use of the um, elastic component of your reps, which is why training faster at that point in time becomes an advantage. So four zero X zero, uh, as a standard for training, this is what I use more with general population, but with the athletic population, as they become more advanced in training years or in training age, you want to speed up that eccentric tempo and then whatever that tempo is at that point in time for your training, this is the tempo you're going to use for your test because at the end of the day, your test and your training, you need to be able to compare them as apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Uh, lightweight yoke training versus heavyweight yoke training. Uh, so, I mean, both are really good. I don't know the depth of the question, um, what, what's really asked here, but I'm just going to do comparison of both and when to use which one. So, uh, they're both very interesting. So, the yoke, it's this uh, modified strongman implement. Uh, where it's a kind of like a, a bar that you put on your back as if you were doing a back squat and then on each side uh, you have like uh, arms where you can load these arms at a lower point so like for the most part the load are about at knee to mid shin level and then you walk with this uh, and then what it requires is that a lot of balance and stability of all the core stabilizers, the hip, the knee, the ankle stabilizers. So it's a very good uh, all-around modified strongman exercise for conditioning your athletes. So here's the thing. So if you're training an athlete where uh, you're doing yoke as a conditioning method, but this specific athlete tends to work at higher velocities and you do want to use the yoke to work all of these ankles and knee and hip stabilizers well then it makes sense to use a lighter load at faster velocities doing like figure eights and stuff like that to create more of that uh, stabilization at high speed now on the flip side if you're training someone like a lineman where the movements that they're undergoing uh, tends to be a little slower in terms of velocities and they have to counter heavier loads, which is the defensive end or defensive tackle, then to use the yoke at higher loads with a slower um, uh, stride frequency, then in that case, it might be beneficial. But in both situations, it doesn't mean that you can't use both at a certain point in time in your training. Uh, but just understand that uh, obviously the lighter load would allow you much faster strike frequency while the heavier load although the strength of the stabilizers will be challenged quite a lot the strike frequency uh, will not be able to be as fast as the lighter load so these are things to take into consideration when it comes to your conditioning training approaching the competitive season depending on who's the athlete you're training so how do you choose when to use chains or bands uh, so, I mean, both are accommodating resistance implements. So, uh, whenever you're training a movement with a, a ascending strength curve, uh, 
So like on bench press, for example, when it's um, harder at the chest and as you're pushing through concentric, it becomes easier and easier and easier. So the use of chains and bands become, becomes very interesting because as the movement becomes easier, now these uh, implements makes it harder and harder and harder as you're pushing. So that's why we call it accommodating resistance implement because it ac accommodates at a certain strength curve. Uh, now, so both the chains and the bands have the same purpose. But to me, how you determine which one to use uh, has a little bit more to do with the uh, training level of the client. Uh, in my opinion, the chains are easier, so I like to use them first. Then once you've, you've submitted the client to chains, then you can progress to the bands. Uh, now, what I like about the bands, though, is the uh, overspeed component during the centric because the bands are shortening and which creates a faster concentric, so even more explosive and acceleration component. So you could ar also argue that uh, once you've been submitted to both, if you were to decide on which one to use in a phase where you're getting closer to the competitive season, and you want to emphasize explosive strength, then I would I would say that the bands could be a better choice at that point in time, uh, simply because you can create even more um, acceleration because of that overspeed component. So to me, like both can be used, chains one, bands number two, very progression, but again, you have a little bit more explosive component, in my opinion, with the bands, which is why I would use them later on uh, once you've been exposed to both. How strict am I on form and technique? Do I ever leave any room to cheat? Um, I mean, generally speaking, no, but it really depends. So with entry-level uh, trainees, I do not allow any room to cheat. Like you, I want to be very, very stick, strict, not only with tempo, but with technique. Because at this point, the client is learning the motor pattern. So you want to reinforce the pattern as best you can on each and every rep of each and every set so that the learning becomes more effective. Once you get to a certain point where you, you have complete control of the movement pattern, you have a good background, you have good inter intramuscular coordination and now you really want to push the envelope of a set then and you're going to failure so let's say you're doing a repeated effort day you're doing like uh, eight ten reps and you want to go to failure then i'm okay if like the last rep or two are not perfect technique uh, if I consider that the client still has control, if the client has control and the technique is not perfect for like one or two reps, I'm fine with it because now he's trying to push himself to go beyond. So at that point in time, I see no issues with it. But again, you need to have this good overall control of technique before you attempt doing that. You cannot, because if you allow the client to cheat too early in their training age, you kind of delay their potential to truly learn and truly get the high levels of strength because on these lifts, it's only when you master a technique that you can really hope to get to really high levels of strength. You don't want to shortchange uh, the long-term potential of the client because you want to allow short-term gratification of higher loads. So how do I differentiate hypertrophy between a bodybuilder and an athlete? So like I've said before, hypertrophy is hypertrophy. So there's no true difference in that sense. But the difference, if you want, is the bodybuilder, because there's no real demand for athleticism, you will be, afford, you will be allowed to afford yourself to do phases where you're really, really, really driving volume. You're really on the metabolic hand of things. For example, you could do accumulation phases using giant sets, use, using tri sets and post exhaustions and stuff like that. Uh, because the bodybuilder, again, because of the lack of need for athleticism for a sport, it's okay to really go on the metabolic end and really focus on nutrient partitioning and uh, 
the cellular activity of the cell and all that type of stuff, that's fine. And it's not that you can't do it with the athlete. I would say that if you do this with the athletes, it really depends on where your athlete stands in terms of one, his level of hypertrophy and the demand of the sport, two, where he stands into a training age, and three, where he stands into uh, his off-season training. So if he has a long off-season and he's a very skinny athlete and he needs to put on size, then there's no problem, in my opinion, for that athlete to do more bodybuilding type hypertrophy training early in the off season because you will have enough time to transfer that hypertrophy into strength and power. But the reality of real uh, sports training, especially once you get to the professional level, is the off season becomes very, very short. So although you might have athletes that needs to bump up their hypertrophy, the thing is you don't have enough time to waste on the metabolic end of things because you really need to make sure that the athlete will be as efficient as possible when the season comes about. So the training in order to force more hypertrophy adaptation, instead of activating satellite cells through extreme volume like you would see with the giant sets and all, you might instead focus on eccentric methods where now the centric methods create the activation of satellite cells because of, of the trauma that the centric training causes on these muscle fibers. And the advantage of eccentric methods is now this will also promote a lot of strength, which will then be easier to transfer that new hypertrophy into more effective power output. So, you know, again, hypertrophy is hypertrophy, is an increase in the cross-section area of the muscle, but the training modalities used uh, can really affect your ability to be more um, effect effective or more powerful on the field. So that's why you just have to make sure that the method selection is appropriate for the athlete you're training. So if you program squat one and squat two during the same training week, Will you experience faster plateaus on that lift compared to the other primate lift? Um, no, because one, the back squat, you tend to be able to have a much higher frequency of training on it than uh, the other lift, especially compared to the upper body because of the fact that the hip joint is more resilient than the shoulder joint and creating the same stressor is not as um, challenging in the long term instead of uh, injury prevention than the upper body exercise on the shoulder joint but also the back squat compared to the front squat and the deadlift is just a little quicker to recover from so to that effect to 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 train the back back squat twice a week for one three-week mesocycle it's not that hard to do in, in that sense now that being said you still have to make sure that your progression and load, so let's say you're doing five sets of six on uh, your squat one workout for your A series on Tuesday, and you're doing five sets of six on your squat two workout A series on Friday. Now you have to make sure that your progression and load from that session one on Tuesday to session two on Friday is a little bit smaller than you, you, you would usually on a week-to-week -week basis if you were to squat, let's say, only on Tuesday for a three-week phase. So this is one little nuance, so that's why that's a good question. You just have to be a little more careful about your load progression so you don't, like, uh, overshoot too fast so that the last week you, you kind of have, like, a, uh, a um, diminishing return in your training. So if you're used, for example, if you're one of those guys who can typically go up 4% per workout, then instead go 2% per squat workout. So you see, you're, you're still going to progress the load the same rate at the end of the three week, but what's happening is you're rehearsing the pattern to a much greater extent, uh, which will help by the time you move on to the next phase where you're now moving to a mesocycle where you're squatting only on Tuesday, which at that point, you typically will be able to bump up the load more than normal for that three week phase. So that's one of the advantage of doubling up on the squat for a mesocycle like this.